Hello everyone and welcome to this video which is in our Reengineering the Chess Classic series. I'm Grandmaster Matthew Sadler and we are finishing our um, look at the games of the great German player Richard Teichmann with um, actually a game that he lost. <coughs> Pardon me. It was from the final round of the Karlsbad uh, 1911 tournament which Teichmann won in fantastic style. Um, he'd already won it, but uh, he lost his last game against a uh, very strong player, Duras. Um, and, uh, um, well, it's just a very striking game. I um, analysed the game quite a while ago uh, between uh, Capablanca and Richard Teichmann, and it was uh, a sort of a Queen's Gambit declined endgame in which, um, well, Capablanca demonstrated the theme of the Lynx Knights, which are knights just sort of dancing around the position and uh, keeping in contact with each other. Um, this game is another example of that and just even more uh, outrageous, really. So uh, really is uh, an incredible display of, uh, of horsepower, this one. So strap in and let's have a look at it. Um, so this position arose from um, some sort of um, um, Rai Lopez type of position. Um, yeah, I mean, black seems to be doing pretty well. Um, bishop on b7 isn't great, sort of uh, restricted by um, by these pawns. But, um, well, this knight on f5 looks like it might be in trouble. And, uh, yeah, it doesn't look, doesn't look so bad for uh, for black, really. Um, actually, in order to uh, to try and save this knight on, uh, on f5 from uh, a fate like uh, g6, Duras played the move c5, just uh, looking to get an outpost on uh, on d6. But after takes on c5, he took with a knight on c5, which is um, quite interesting. B takes c5 was also possible, just uh, securing that uh, square on d6. Not quite clear whether you want to get rid of the knight or not, but I guess that, um, that Duras felt that um, um, if you get a, a knight on d6 just against a bishop on b7, then that would be a pretty good thing to have. Of course, uh, one key thing here is that uh, the rook is attacking the pawn on a6 here. So uh, that's a, another little uh, irritating thing for the for the light squared bishop to defend. Um, so actually the engines wanted um, um, uh, black to take on c5 and go bishop c8 because um, after knight d6, then f3 is possible, which is actually you know reasonably dangerous. Um, um, yeah, I mean this knight looks very strong here, but um, yeah, if you you know if you take on f3, I can take off and take on h3, and then go rook takes f3. So actually, this this would be perfectly fine for black. But um, um, and well, obviously, if you can do it, you free your pieces. What um, um, uh, Teichmann did was actually quite natural. Kind of tried to improve this really. He just played bishop c8, looking for knight takes c5 and bishop f5 without giving white the outpost on d6. But this runs into something much more uh, annoying. It runs into queen b3 check. And the problem is if you go king h8, then knight e6 is very annoying, forking the uh, the two rooks. So um, Teichmann played rook f7, but he still got hit with uh, knight e6. So we're uh, attacking the rook on d8. The rook's only got one move. And then we take with the knight on g7 here. Still attacking the rook on e8, and of course the rook on f7 is pinned to the king by the queen, so the knight on g7 is completely free. So where are you going now? Um, rook d8 was uh, was Teichmann's uh, choice here, and uh, yeah, now uh, actually the engines uh, suggest a, a very strong move here, which is uh, g4. Um, so supporting the knight on f5 and also. Um, Securing a good square on h5 for the knight, a protected square at least. And obviously if fg, fg, and uh, well, we don't like this uh, uh, this open line at all. Uh, Duras played uh, knight h5, and uh, after queen h5, um, he found nothing better than going back to g7, and uh, Teichmann returned to f6. And now, instead of this move g4, uh, the knight went to, uh, to e6. And after rook e8, Duras's knight went to c7. I mean, this is really quite incredible, right? It's been quite a journey. The knight's gone all the way around here, then back again, back and over to here again. So uh, incredible little journey. And after um, rook d8, um, Duras played the move queen e6. 
Now, yeah, this is maybe starting to uh, to be a little bit of a false path for uh, for Duras, but um, well, you've got to say it's quite stunning to look at. So, um, King H8 was played, and then Duras played Knight H6. So these knights jumping all over the place. Um, Rook E7 takes and takes, and uh, actually, well, you suddenly realise that the um, the knights are not so superb anymore. They were beautifully coordinating in the centre. But now after knight takes a6, <clears throat> they're both, um, um, well, rather ra rather out of the way there. Um, so king g7 was played by uh, by Teichmann and knight g4 was Duras's reply. You can go knight f5 as well, but then we uh, we take off, takes, rook takes d3. Nah, this is pretty good for um, for white, really. Um, uh, dra both dragon and uh, stockfish were winning games as white here. Um, just um, what is it? Uh, it's uh, one extra pawn and uh, a nice outpost on e6. Double pawns make it just a little bit more tricky for white. I mean, it's it's easy to end up with uh, extra but valueless pawns, but still, you know, this uh, this looks pretty good, really. Um, knight g4 was played by Duras. Takes takes, and um, um, yeah, this is uh, uh, kind of uh, kind of interesting here. Uh, bishop a6 was played by um, um, by Teichmann. Bishop g4 was maybe a little bit stronger. But after here and here, knight c5. Um, well, we can go um, uh, rook d4 here. Um, but, um, um, oh yeah, sorry, no. Um, rook a3 was uh, what we were playing. Just to, also in order to be able to have uh, rook d3 at some stage. Also keeping the pawn on b4 protected so we can go rook c1 and line up on here. That's the one. And after bishop b8, you had g3 played, h5, king f2, and uh, and white was uh, was quite a bit better there. Um, this was ending in uh, wins for uh, stockfish beat dragon from this position. Uh, Teichmann took on a6, rook a6 and rook d3, but after rook c6, rook d4, f3, rook b4, rook f2, then um, position was quite difficult for, uh, for Teichmann here. Rook a7, rook fc2. Rook a1 check, rook a7, rook e6, and uh, Teichmann resigned. Uh, just taking on e5 there, and then, well, this pawn will go afterwards. Just uh, nothing uh, amazing there, but just a striking game with all those knights, uh, you know, jumping around the place. Just uh, uh, just thought it was worth, uh, worth sharing. Just a, a nice little curiosity to, uh, to finish with. So there we are. I mean, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, this trip through uh, memory lane, looking at some uh, some games of Richard Teichmann. I said I'm really impressed with uh, with this player. And I can uh, definitely understand why uh, he had such a high reputation with his uh, colleagues and peers uh, of that era. And just uh, yeah, you know, a shame that uh, that he's just unknown. That uh, somehow he's one of those players who just uh, disappears from view somehow. But definitely uh, worth looking at his games. So there we are. I'm not quite sure who I'm going to do next in the classic series. Maybe have a little break. Plenty of, uh, of engine games to look at. But, um, well, if you enjoyed the series, enjoyed this uh, video, why not give a like, subscribe to the channel, take a look at my new book, Reengineering the Chess Classics, full of classic games, brilliant analysis like this. And otherwise, you know, thanks very much for watching and hope to see you at the next videos. Thanks for watching.